everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Bennett. I'm the department head for the performing arts uh, at CA, and I also direct the choirs and teach some other music courses here. And we are so glad that you braved the cold uh, and, and came out to this event. We've been excitedly preparing for it for, it uh, feels like, months for some of us and others since yesterday. <laughs> but, uh, but we will be, uh, but it's a really fun event and we're glad that you uh, came out and we all are really excited to perform for you. Um, this is an incredibly varied program with music from hundreds of years ago and um, uh, or an original composition uh, that was written, I'm assuming, in the 21st century. So, um, so and everything in between. So uh, enjoy yourselves, and we're going to start with the uh, this jazz group that's going to play a couple tunes. <laughs> Thank you. 
much. That was Mike Pipeman on trumpet. jazz waltz, 3-4 waltz, we're doing sort of a 4-4 four, four funk version of this song. So this is all blues as a funk song. Okay.
One of the things I enjoy most about playing an instrument is the skill that you gather in taking lessons and also to participate in great music that may be written in this century or two centuries ago. Uh, it happens that this piece was written for a specific flutist, oboist, and clarinetist, and the piano part was played by the composer himself, Emile Sansos. The oboist in question is my great great grand teacher, and both my uh, woodwind colleagues here have similar relations to the people who premiered this piece. So when you're learning an instrument, you're not only learning from a particular person, but you're actually absorbing knowledge that has been passed down in the case of woodwind teachers who descended from the Paris Conservatory. Decades, if not centuries, of knowledge, and that connects me to this piece in a way that I don't uh, 
often experience with some others. Sansan was uh, invited to Russia to play in a bunch of Easter concerts, and after the director of the St. Petersburg Conservatory heard the woodwinds playing, he made all of the wind students attend the final concert to see what these instruments could truly do. So I hope you're similarly impressed. <laughs> Thank you. 
have seen Michael's, uh, Michael Bennett's email to the school about what's the relationship between animal gut and uh, music. So originally we were going to play on gut strings because Colleen and I play in an orchestra where we play on instruments which are constructed and designed as and uh, we play on them in the style they were actually played on historically 200, 300 years ago. Um, and the, the, so over the years these instruments have evolved and the shapes of the instruments have changed. And so today we're going to play on Baroque bows um, because we're playing a piece from the 17th century actually 18th century. <laughs> and so, Colleen's going to say a bit about it. So you can see there's a little bit difference in construction of the Baroque bow, which is, um, that's convex, right? And this would be concave. So a little bit difference in the way they're shaped. You can notice that the tip is a lot different than the modern bow, which allows you to release the sound a little bit more. It's a little bit more speech-like. Um, it's lighter in weight. Um, and there's actually a little less hair that you can use. So those are the main differences. And also you hold it up. This is actually what I have real small cellists. I'll start them at this sort of choked up bow hold, which is where we would hold it for Baroque versus the modern. You would hold it right at the frog, right at the end of it. So that's, that's the little lesson on Baroque bow. <laughs> and then the, the, we were going to be on, on gut strings because nowadays we have modern strings and they're covered in metal and the inside is nylon or these synthetic cores. Um, but my viola very sadly broke, and I went to spend to get it fixed, and it actually got even more broke when they tried to fix it. Very sadly, my instrument's about 270 years old, but um, it's not terribly serious. Nonetheless, we are now playing on modern instruments, but I wanted just to send these through the audience. One is an old uh, metal string that's been used, and one is a gut string, and you can just pass these around. Um, please quietly, <laughs> and just feel the difference. Like this is a raw animal gut, and basically they take um, hide. Uh, they sorry, they take the intestine from sheep or cows or um, Go goats. Thank you. In fact, this is um, this is ram. <laughs> this, this particular thing's come from. Um, anyway, and you'll see that this the metal string is end. They they take both ends and they do different things to them. These last a lot longer and they, um, they project a lot more. So the music that we perform, often we're playing in halls that are way bigger than the halls that, or rooms that um, music was played in when it was written hundreds of years ago. So the sound is a whole different quality, but you're gonna have to come and hear us play outside of CA to hear that difference. But you can pass this around, just have a sort of feel, slide like, your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great, uh, maybe you don't want to see <laughs> diseases, but anyway, it's kind of cool. And if you're wondering what the word mesto means, it means sad, rueful, and joyless. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I'm going to play Honeysuckle Rose by Fax Waller, written in 1929 in New Jersey. And I think it was also in a movie in around 1980. There was a movie called Honeysuckle Rose and they used it in it.
Michael asked me to say a few words about the next piece. Uh, this is a piece by Johann, Johann Sebastian Bach, and uh, it was composed in 1726, which places it about its 300th anniversary coming up, so we can all look forward to that. Uh, Bach <laughs> composed about 200 of these sacred cantatas, uh, and we're going to hear one of two uh, solo tenor cantatas that he composed. Uh, the other one was originally thought to be by Bach, but turned out to actually be by Telemann, uh, who you heard earlier on the program. So this is the only one that we know for, we hope for sure, was by Bach. Um, it's full of angst and anger and trembling. Uh, and, <laughs> and it's, um, it was originally written to be performed a half step lower. So <laughs> if there wasn't enough angst and anger and trembling, I get to also sing a little bit higher. It's supposed to be <laughs> hard for the tenor voice. So this is Ich Arma Mensch.
So I have a microphone here, I'm not sure if I'll need it, um, but I'm going to try to talk and prepare the piano at the same time, and then I'll take a bow after because it'll be impressive. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> so, um, prepared piano, has, has many people heard of prepared piano? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, a couple of people. So John Cage wrote a piece in like 1938, that was the first prepared piano piece, so it's actually a while ago as well. Um, yeah, so he was writing a piece for Merce Cunningham, a dance company, um, and they couldn't fit a percussion ensemble in the pit under the stage, um, so he just put a bunch of junk in the piano and he called it a percussion section, which kind of works. Technically, piano is a percussion instrument because it, you, you know, you hit it. So um, I started, he put screws and he just destroyed the piano, so it's pretty cool, it sounds really beautiful, but I started putting shoelaces in them because I kept getting yelled at. Um, so, and I was playing for some dance classes at Boston Conservatory for the past 10 years or so. Um, so I put in um, shoelaces once before I would play, it kind of made it feel a little special. I'm, I'm a drummer, I'm not a pianist, you're, you're about to find out. Um, so, shoelaces and the piano, I was recording, I started, I went through a phase where I didn't have any good recordings of these pieces, so I, um, I started just taking out my iPhone and recording in the dance classes, and I put some up on SoundCloud. And this choreographer commissioned me for a piece, and she didn't like the piece I made, so she just started rehearsing to my SoundCloud improvisation which was really messed up because it was really complicated and I was not ready to recreate that piece. It was like all over the place. I mean, I'm about to play it, so I don't, I don't know why I'm describing it. Um, so Beaver.World is the company that I wrote a piece for and, well, they took a piece of mine from SoundCloud and I had to play it and it's like just a lot of repetitions of random numbers, and it was all improvised, so it's super easy to improvise. But to recreate it in a recording studio and get a nice recording was like challenging. So um, I had to write out a score. I, if those of you who know me know, I do a lot of graphic notation, which is like kind of drawings and um, 
drawings and some music notation as well, and there's this whole thing. So I have a graphic score for this piece that came out with the... Um, that came out with the recording, it's on Bandcamp. Does anyone know Bandcamp? Raise your hand. Okay, Bandcamp's a sweet website. Um, it's like the alternative to iTunes and um, Spotify and all that stuff. You can pay the artists, which is which is very helpful in this in this economy. Um, so it's on Bandcamp. I have the score as well. I call it a paper record because it's in a vinyl record size, and there's four scores, four recordings, and all the graphic scores are the shape of the vinyl rep record and so paper records, right? And also because you get to keep it, so it's like a record of the past. Um, and now I'm out of things to talk about. But I'm still done though. I'm going to focus on this for a second. Um, so this piece, okay, okay. So this piece is kind of in the minim minimalist world. Um, so John Cage, we talked about 1938, uh, minimalists came a bit later, 60s and 70s. Um, and I, I, my work has often been called minimalist, even though I don't necessarily... I mean, I, I relate to that, I, I reflect on it, I do a lot of loopy stuff, but I just think I'm a drummer, and I think that's what drummers do. It's a little more accessible, it's kind of like a um, pushing away from um, the super complicated music of the like post-World War II era um, in, in Europe and in America. So it's kind of in New York City, they would play at art galleries and people would like lay on the floor um, and listen. And my dad, who doesn't know anything about music, had a Philip Glass record when he was a kid, so that means something to me, that people, he listened to the Ramones and had a Philip Glass record, so I think that's cool. And I'm still not done. I had to test the microphones in here earlier with some students, and they have to just keep talking and keep talking, and I feel like that right now. I feel bad for them. I'm sorry, students. So close. <laughs> so actually, um, one thing that's nice about this piece, um, a lot of people, you know, will prepare pianos, but they have to get approval for it, and it's like this whole thing. Um, which is why I was never allowed to do it, because no one knows my work, um, no big deal. But um, some, a lot of pianists put their fingers in the piano, though. You get a lot of cool sounds. I'm, I'm mostly muting it and stuff, I don't do a lot of harmonics, but... but they'll put like guitar takes and stuff inside. are actually terrible to the strings and for tuning, so I feel like I'm doing a service by putting the shoestrings in. One more shoestring, everybody relax. <laughs> Thank you. 
now that you're all calm and relaxed, we're going to get you out of that mindset real quick. <laughs> with, um, um, so the, uh, Stephanie and I love to play. Uh, there's a lot of music written for, for two people sitting at the piano, so you've got what's called four hands on the keyboard. Um, and this is a piece by Francis Poulenc, a, a composer that, that both Stephanie and I love. Um, and it was actually written when he was about 18 years old. Um, and I think you can hear some of the teen angst um, in this piece, but also a lot of the emotional roller coaster that it is to be uh, a teenager. So.
summer. This is our big group finale with everybody. Um, and while we're getting set up, I want to thank the crew that's been helping us throughout the night. Yeah. Along, with, along with James in the back and Deanna down front. Um, and yeah, uh, everyone's going to come down here and we're going to sing you a little Beatles tune now. Sing and play with our, our grand faculty uh, chamber orchestra that we have here. Um, we, we really value the opportunity to do this for all of you because, um, you know, many of you take lessons and, you know, play in our ensembles and we tell you to do something and yeah, I bet sometimes you're thinking like, oh yeah, well, I'd like to see you do it or, you know, <laughs> something like that. And so we get the chance tonight to, to show off a little bit and, and really, um, you know, share, share back with you all what we love to do. I'm sure. Great. I think I need my music for later. All right. Everybody come. Thanks also to Chris for making these arrangements. This is by an ancient group called the Beatles. You may have from they're about to celebrate their 300th anniversary. No. Um, uh,
it up for everybody. Stay safe, stay warm. See you on Monday.